everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our fireside chat. Before we begin, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, one, uh, you will all be on mute, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear your voice. So please, any questions you have throughout the uh, fireside chat, please submit them to the Q&A. And we have time inside the fireside chat to take questions. So we're really looking forward to, to the questions you have. Uh, and of course, this great opportunity uh, that we have today. So I'm just going to start by saying, wow, what an honor it is to be interviewing one of the most influential people in the gaming industry. Can I call the godfather of gaming or the knight of nerds, Sir Ian Livingstone? How are you, Sir Ian? I'm very well, thank you. And uh, please call me Ian. I um, haven't quite got used to the, the knight reference of being a sir yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, you know, the sir is actually amazing. Is it true that you were the first ever person to be knighted for their service to the gaming industry? That is, uh, I think it's, it's absolutely, I mean, I'm delighted it was me, but it's clearly overdue for the industry. I mean, all the other entertainment industries and creative industries have been recognized um, many times. So hopefully I'm the first of many for a knighthood or a damehood. I think what the problem with the games industry is often that it lacks celebrity and the powers that be don't know anybody in the industry. They hardly know in the games companies out there. They've heard of games titles, but I think there's still a lot more to be done about educating the establishment, investors, government, parents and teachers about the amazing industry that is now $250 billion a year, 3 billion people playing and speaks to generation as their preferred interactive entertainment. That is amazing. And you mentioned uh, the lack of uh, um, uh, celebrities, but there is one right behind you and people in the chat are asking if it's actually real and want to know the real size of that Lara Croft. It is. So can, well, can, I can I trouble you to, to, to give some perspective on, on what we're seeing behind us? People think it's a fake okay. background. Well, yes. sure that <laughs> of course, we have, we have got celebrities, but most of them are virtual. But sometimes we make analog versions. And uh, if I may, I'll just show you. Uh, Lara Croft and her. This is not wow. A, uh, this is a real background. Um, this was the the models we used to put into game stores in in 1996 when we launched Tomb Raider. When I was chairman of of Eidos. and of course, Tomb Raider and Lara Croft became uh, not just a game but a brand uh, oh, that yeah. survived the test of time and become a franchise like Laura, like um, like James Bond in cinema and that long may it continue of course I'm no longer associated with Lara Croft so I can only watch on like a almost like a proud <laughs> father of, of seeing how she she uh, fares in this day and age yeah so I, I'd actually would love to learn a little bit more about this journey I mean very few people have impacted people <laughs> Uh, from analog to digital and beyond. Uh, without spoiling your book, right, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your journey from living in a van, is that true, to founding founding a $4 billion company uh, to where you are today at founding Hero Capital? Uh, yes, well, <laughs> I guess, I, I mean, I could, you could say I kind of joined the games industry not long after chess was invented, it seems so long ago. Uh, I started a company called Games Workshop in 1975 with two old school friends, Steve Jackson and John Peake. And we were passionate games players and we wanted to somehow turn our hobby of playing games into some sort of community-based uh, games company. Um, and um, one of the founders, John, was a pretty good craftsman and uh, he would make wooden games, which I'd go and sell to to game shops and, and department stores, and Steve would do the administration, but that really wasn't where we wanted the company to go. So we we published a, a little fanzine called Owl and Weasel and sent it out to everybody we knew in games. And somehow uh, one found its way to the desk of Gary Gygax in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And he wrote back to us and said, love your little magazine. Here's this game I've uh, invented uh, designed what do you think and that game was Dungeons and Dragons and it didn't look much it was a plain box with a quite um, naive artwork inside and three largely unintelligible rule books but when you opened the box of D&D opened up your imagination like no other game had ever done before and I don't think any game ever will again uh, this is more of a designer game kit it's a 
a role playing game in which one person designs a labyrinth of rooms and passageways and populates them with monsters and treasure and acts as the dungeon master and the others role play as characters of wizards and heroes and players and go on these fantastic journeys of the mind, effectively theatre on the fly. So we played it, became immediately obsessed. We ordered six copies. And on the back of that order, we got an exclusive three year distribution agreement for the whole of Europe because Gary was also operating out of a flat in, in Lake Geneva. So it was a very start of the games industry as, as such. And we had to make it up as we went along. And we, we ended up selling Dungeons and Dragons out of our flats and um, decided the next following year, just Steve and I, by which time John had left the company, he didn't want to be uh, involved with role playing games, he more even enjoy traditional games much more. So we went to the state, signed up the fledgling games companies that were beginning there, uh, got to meet Gary Gygax and the rest of the TSR team, uh, came back full of energy, loads of games ordered, but with nowhere to live and uh, nowhere to operate out of. So we did end up living in Steve's van for a period of three months because all we could afford was a small office at the back of the state agents. And um, so in those days, you go to a bank manager for finance and say, we've got this great game. It's called Dungeons and Dragons. You go on these incredible journeys of the mind. And he looked at us rather like a, a dog watching television, had no understanding whatsoever of what we were talking about and asked us to leave. And But his, in his defense, we probably weren't what we call investor ready. We, we hadn't prepared any financial statements or have any investment decks. And nevertheless, we, we were living the dream and we opened our first store in 1978 and the added White Dwarf magazines, it did our miniatures. And then we also started began to, to read, to write um, fighting fantasy game books. These were interactive books, um, analog hypertext, a uh, branching narrative, but with a game system attached, quite different to choose your adventure books, which are, have no game system. And they were super um, popular at the time. They sold some 20 million copies, translated into 35 languages. But it was reaching a point where we were running Games Workshop during the day, which was now expanding with more shops, more games. And of course, with the, the publication of Warhammer and also writing finally fancy game books at night. And there was a point um, where we had to end up um, handing over the reins of the business to a managing director, Brian Ansell, who was running Citadel Miniatures at the time. But during this time, um, I was approached by the founders of a startup games company called Domark, who asked me to write their launch product, which was called Eureka, which I did. And it was programmed in Hungary for secrecy because it was a, a prize on offer, a monetary prize for the first person to solve that, that, uh, that game. And um, I joined Domark when we sold out to an M management buyout in, in 1991, when we sold Games Workshop. And of course, we watched on as Games Workshop subsequently um, floated and became, as you say, a, a three billion pound stroke, four billion dollar market cap uh, company listed on the London Stock Exchange. But I jumped ship into the digital world, uh, joined Domark, probably at the worst time when the 16-bit market was about to fall off the edge of a cliff. And um, we decided to put four companies together. I was appointed executive chairman of Nuco, which was listed on the stock exchange. And that company is called IDOS Interactive. And of course, IDOS, most famously known for launching Lara Croft Tomb Raider, um, which we'd acquired in the early March 1996. So my journey then went on to being a, a, a global publisher of mainly AAA games, uh, and a UK public listed company, and and I left the company when in the when it was acquired by Square Enix in Japan. Became an angel investor, had some great successes in mobile with companies like uh, Playdemic, who created Golf Clash, and also Mediatonic, who created Fall Guys. Uh, but also, was appointed chairman of of Sumo Group, um, which. Um, we ended up um, exiting to ten cent last year for one point three billion dollars. And during this whole through process, I moved almost from a kind of an entrepreneur designer to an investor. And last, of course, but not least, becoming a co-founder of Hiri Capital, which is a, a UK um, venture capital company, uh, now raising our second fund, the first fund of £115 million being fully deployed into 22 uh, games and technology related game uh, companies. And um, really enjoying that side because I get to 
put my finger now in everybody else's pie and hopefully add a lot of value leveraging 47 years of pattern recognition to help them uh, realize their dreams in the same way we did uh, all those years ago with Workshop and, and IDOS and, and Sumo. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and more amazing how you're able to sum up your life in just a few minutes. But of course, uh, each thing is a huge feat and an amazing accomplishment. And just going off of where you are right now at Hero Capital, um, can you tell us what are some of the trends that interest you the most? Well, the, the, the wonderful thing about the games industry is that every new technology that comes along is additive to the, to the opportunity. Uh, in the early days, it was pretty basic PCs and simple consoles. And then Facebook became a platform. Uh, then, of course, smartphones became an incredible platform, representing 50% of rev global revenues. Um, we've seen how AR, VR, esports have all come along and had an enormous impact. And of course, now everyone's talking about the metaverse and, 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 and beyond. And, and what we look for, of course, is innovation. Um, we look for teams. I always look for those teams where the creative person has an on equal footing with the, the, the managing director, for want of a better expression. They enable each other to be incredible, whether it's games or technology. So we're looking for intellectual property, we're looking for technology, we're looking for understanding of business models, the way the games industry has moved from a premium product, um, price product in a physical box, navigating the supply chain uh, to get it into a retail shop to ultimately reach a consumer to now to a point where it's games are often free at the point of delivery serving a global audience on whatever digital platform it's being served on, whether it's smartphones, digital consoles, PCs, being able to monetize global audiences through data, improve the monetization, improve the playability, improve the experience, and games as a service now giving the opportunity to run games for perhaps a decade or more. For example, Clash of Clans, Candy Crush Saga, and other, other games. So... What we look for is a combination of a great team, great technology, of course, great games when it comes to games, games play. But um, it's 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 recognizing the strength of the team and their ability to execute and their understanding of business models, market opportunity, total addressable markets, and have a, a unique or pretty much unique proposition that might have been done before, but hadn't been done well before. So it's it, there's no kind of hard and fast rule, but it's it's this is a people business, particularly in the games industry, and you have to get on with people. So it's a from from a hero point of view, it's a partnership relationship. We're totally allied with whoever we invest in, because their success is our success. So we don't just provide money; we provide expertise in various modes of 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 of. Uh, the depth of some of the, the people in our team. Yeah, it's amazing. And I'm just curious about also the expansion of games out into even the industry of TV and movies, looking at Laura Croft there in the background again, Tomb Raider becoming a movie itself, and so many hits today also becoming movies. I'm just curious if that's part of the of the, the expansion of not just the, of a game, but also a franchise that uh, people look for in, in narratives and good stories in these games today? Well, there's no hard and fast rule what makes a good game. Clearly, in AAA games, you need a, a differentiable character. Obviously, Lara Croft for Tomb Raider was totally differentiable at the time. There hadn't been any other female lead characters in the game that of any significance. And it was a game that had great technology, great graphics, an incredible character, a character that appealed to everybody, an independent, strong, intelligent, athletic female lead um, with pillars of the game of exploration, combat, and puzzle solving. And it was incredible at, at the time just, just to see the the difference that that game made to the gaming landscape, because most of the games at that time were 2D side-scrolling games. And yeah. here's a, one of the very first games with a 3D character moving into the 3D world. And, and, 
and it was way beyond other games at the, at the time. And again, it just kind of shows the, the importance of, of technology. I mean, people say to me, what are the three most important things about a game? I will always say gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. Technology and, and graphics are absolutely crucial, but they play an, a supporting and enabling role for the gameplay experience for the consumer. So another part of, 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 of Heroes uh, Remit is really is to look at technology platforms and digital services and and technology to 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 boost production i mean clearly that's one of the reasons we decided incredible because you know advances in compute power who's going to say no to that yeah definitely and especially in a time now i think you know the word crunch is a uh, maybe a dirty word in the industry but i think the entire world is feeling the crunch at the moment and i think even more so uh, productivity uh, like you mentioned, uh, like Incredibuild, being able to maximize the most compute power, uh, making the best out of your um, existing IP, which also your talented people, in times even when it's hard to hire more people, to be able to really put, uh, you know, something that you can measure productivity with and boost productivity is, I, I think we all agree, would be uh, definitely something uh, that uh, everyone is looking for. And as yourself, uh, if you're a capital looking into, uh, investments as you did with incredible i mean technology as a as a f enabler and facilitator is clearly going to appeal to everybody on the, from middleware to uh, everyone's talking about ai now and chat gpt to do write some of the code for you or, or, yeah. or create some of the non-player characters for you in game i mean you're going to see huge advances in, in ai and of course that'll be another area we might be, be looking to to invest so the it's constantly amazing how exciting the opportunities are in, in the games industry. Always come with challenges, but always the opportunities are more than big enough to want you to do it. Yeah, yeah definitely. So I, I do see the questions coming in and I, and I want to make sure that we have time for the questions because that was our promise to, to our attendees. So uh, let's jump into that. I'll read off a couple of ones that I have here. Um, and uh, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, the rest of our program. So the first one we have is, what is your favorite game? My favorite game. I mean, a bit like, a bit like saying, what's my favorite child? And I've got four. I mean, it, it depends also whether <laughs> it's a video game or a board game. So for video, Let's do one of each. Okay. So for, I guess it has to be what I play the most. Now I have to kind of caveat this with. Um, you, you want to play a single player game, multiplayer game, you want to play <laughs> locally, do you want to play online? Um, um what, what the, I have the person to who asked the question didn't didn't specify, so it's it's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> so what I must say, of course, is that you know, at my age, <laughs> my reflexes are not what they were. And therefore, any game that involves manual dexterity at speed is really an out for me. I'm gonna last five minutes if if that in Fortnite, I'm going to lose 10 nil at FIFA. So there's absolutely no point in me playing those. So the games I have to play are strategy games. So my go-to games are like Civilization. I guess that's my my nice. one for that, nice. my go-to game. And for board games, um, you know, I run a thing called the Board Games Night Group, which I have been doing since the 80s. And we have a couple of luminaries in, in the group and we meet usually weekly. So there's Steve Jackson, who I co-founded Games Workshop with, and also Peter Molyneux, who was one of the stars of the UK game development scene, originally from, from Populous with, with his first company, Bullfrog, and then with Fable with, uh, with Lionhead, and, and now his mobile games company, 22 Can. So there's an awful lot of games chat at our board games meetings. So we play, again, games that are not too heavy, like seem like work, which is Far too punishing for our old decrepit game brains. So we play games like um, uh, Kalis, Ticket to Ride, Splendor, Small World. Um, what else we play? Seven Wonders. Um, that kind of mid-tier wow. board game where there's there's lots of interaction, a lot of chance to do deals, and absolutely renege on those deals and stab each other in the back. And then I do a a, a newsletter uh, at the end at the end of the week and we keep points for the games and send it out and the, at the end of the year um the winner gets the the, the cup to uh to to hold high and and kind of berate everybody else 
That's nice. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask what the loser has to do, but uh, we'll, we'll go we'll go on to the next question we have here. Actually, what do investors um, it, are mostly looking for when we are raising our Series A in contrast to when we raised our seed round? Well, C round often, of course, is is not a punt, but it's generally usually an, an idea that has traction. And, and as I said earlier, I'm looking for a team. Um, the case in point here, I think, is with an angel investor with Playdemic and, and Mediatonic both had a senior leadership team with the creative director and the managing director on, on an equal basis. And it's no surprise that Playdemic created Golf Clash. The company was sold to Electronic Arts. Um, from it was, it was sold initially to Warner Brothers and then they exited to EA for $1.3 billion. And the same with, with Mediatonic, with Paul Bailey and, and uh, David Bailey and Paul Croft, uh, ultimately creating um, Bull Guys, which was uh, again sold to, to Epic for some six or seven hundred million dollars um, not that long ago. And again, it's that that that's that's that incredible, well motivated leadership team that knows what it's doing. They've they know how to attract the right talent, they know how to raise finance to give them the the runway to be able to execute. Um, and release a game when it's ready, rather than thinking, "Oh, we're running, better, running out of cash. We better, we better launch it soon." You know, the, this, the market is too competitive now for rushed out games to succeed. Um, their understanding of intellectual property um, and being able to retain that IP ownership, um, they understand business models, they understand the market. They've got some skin in the game. You know, we like to invest in companies they've already had a bit of pain i hark back to my days in the van you know we invest a lot of pain and all our little money we had we put into that business to show that we are fully committed and in investing alongside anyone who wants to invest in us we have to prove that we're we're willing to do it ourselves it's very easy to spend other people's money if you haven't invested yourself and um and really a uh, an ability to a attract, you know, retain and monetize audiences at scale and making sure technology does not fall over when companies try to scale and being able to try to attract the right talent. And, and that kind of holds true for, for Series A, apart from, of course, you're looking for now post-revenue rather than pre-revenue opportunities and some, some growth um some some solid metrics where you can do um understand more clearly the value of the company in terms of multiples of revenue and and then forming helping to form strategic alliances because now they have something of of, of real value that has potential to 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 scale so it's just a more sophisticated approach to due diligence and analysis of the opportunity but Clearly, the data should make that decision easier because it's a, a you know a trading company, effectively. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, next question: What makes a great game? Is there anything more than you said? Gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. Well, clearly gameplay. But when we're you know, <laughs> when we when we arrive in this world, we 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 interact. We we learn through play. Play gives us. Can, kind of helps define us of who we are as human beings and I think you have to tap into that emotional link to gameplay I mean I don't want to get too kind of high and mighty about Maslow's theory hierarchy of needs but that's a, that emotional needs of your life's basic needs and then the emotional needs and then the things that we that drive us um, like crafting and warmth and heat and and having um you know customization to display who we are as individuals so there's there has to be community you have to play with friends because that's when you have a shared experience that experience is always heightened and so i'm looking for you know persistent worlds uh, avatars because that speaks to identity um community around worlds that have been created 
and and then the crafting you know the user generated content so it's an ability to be part of the game themselves that that gives people an attraction to games but it's that magic bit of fairy dust that makes you want to come back and back again so getting a really rewarding game loop not a sort of treadmill for monetization but a something that is really magical to make you want to go back and play again because it's really enjoyable. Amazing. Uh, we have a question here about, it's a humbling question. Um, after making it big, uh, does it bring more complexity and responsibility to decision-making and business approaches in general? Is that from my point of view or from their point of view? Um, I guess either way, uh, let's try from your point of view. Well, when you're investing large amounts of money or having money invested you in large amounts, clearly this is, you have a responsibility to do not just what's right, but what's best. Um, and yeah, and when, you, when we invest in companies, it shouldn't be people thinking, oh, We've, we've got some money in the company now, we can all go out and buy Ferraris because that's not profit, that's just capital injection. You, know, you can only get assessed once you start seeing the revenue come in and see how you're really performing. You know, capital is not profit. It uh, gives you opportunities to make profit. So there is a great responsibility to act uh, very responsibly and to do yep. the right thing. Yep. All right, going back to uh, your friend Laura back there, uh, there have been questions about what was your role in the start of the Lara Croft Tomb Raider phenomenon? Um, mine was really related to discovery. Um, I mean, a lot of people claim to have created Lara Croft. It was actually a 2D artist called Toby Gard, um, who works at Core Design in Derby in the UK. And um, after we'd floated IDOS in, in, in um, October 1995, we had the opportunity to buy the only other publicly listed company in the space, which was called Center Gold. Center Gold was a company that was publishing a lot of US games in the UK under the uh, US Gold label. But they also had their own company owned studios, which um, I was tasked really to go and evaluate when we were looking to buy them. So uh, we, um, I set off and saw Silicon Dreams first and then had to go to Derby to assess uh, core design. And uh, I was greeted by Jeremy Heath Smith, who's the managing director. And uh, he showed me through all the, all, the, all the rooms. And finally, almost the last room, I, you could say in a very corny, stereotypical way, it was love at first sight because there was Laura Croft on the screen. And I was just kind of, kind of amazed by, as I said earlier about the, the 3D character moving into the screen, the fact that you could move the camera around for exploration, the ability to, to move and explore and combat and everything was just, and the kind of stars were aligned. And this was such a, a small team of six people, all incredible at what they were doing. And so I said to our board, yeah, we really, really, really must buy this company, which we did. And um, we launched the game in, in October 96. So my role from then on was to help promote and publish and 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 just kind of nurture Lara Croft the game through through the, the gaming world. Amazing. So so through your journey of the last 45 years, can I say, um, what were the biggest changes you have seen over these years? You know, a lot of things remain the same. It's still about gameplay. It's still about people. The platforms have changed. But I think the games industry is clearly a lot more sophisticated now than, than it was. And all the kind of professional component parts that are coming into the games to make it an even greater experience from, from AAA with, with you know, script writers and... and dynamic lighting and, and just high resolution graphics, kind of cinematic quality of, of watching an interactive film effectively. And it's, it's, and of course, last but not least, storytelling coming in in a very meaningful way, not just games like, you know, Heavy Rain and, and Detroit and The Witcher, but 
it's coming into a lot more games now to make the games seem a lot more compelling to want to to play and enjoy the story at the same time and now with the world of gaming moving into the into the metaverse you know connected communities i mean you could say argue that fortnite and roblox are mini metaverses where you can play together hang out together go in case of fortnite go and watch a travis scott concert transact together the 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 role of ai and crypto and transactions going to greater grow and of course that the, the role of technology in enabling all this um is is key so it's uh it's an amazing industry uh, that's always going to evolve and is always going to be uh, growing because of the way it speaks to Generation Z. Our fighting fantasy game box in the eighties really proved that that people want agency. They want to be in control of their destiny rather than just being a passive receiver of a storyline which is being decided, predetermined by a director they want that agency of control and that's what makes the games compelling so it's no surprise that, that you know big online communities playing together are so um appealing especially to generation z because everything they do is interactive they have prolific use of social media and uh, they're fully connected with each other and they're you know almost always on their devices so it's no surprise that they want the entertainment to be interactive as well. Yeah, I think Travis Scott is tweeting right now. Ian Livingstone knows who I am. It was pretty impressive, Ian. <laughs> uh, so we have a question from the audience. Um, I hope I'm saying this right. What of the Eidos's titles? Is it Do X? Do Do X? Do X? Okay. Well, you, you got both those wrong. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's Eidos, as in kaleidoscope. Eidos okay. actually. It was actually Greek for image or form. And the game was called Deus Ex. And okay. that was developed for by, by Iron Storm. We, we, okay. backed, <laughs> we backed Iron Storm way back when um, with John Romero, uh, Tom Hall, and they put out two games, Daikatana and Anachronox. But the third member of Iron Storm was Warren Spector, who I'd worked with in the analog days of, of role playing, and he created um, Deus Ex. And the beauty about Deus Ex is that, I mean, it's an it's absolute classic. It was, you know, the, the key was that um, it was all about the augmentation and, and body parts that you could make your, your character better and more able to get through the adventure, but you could do it in two ways. It was like a uh, kind of RPG, there was a stealth component, and there was a uh, a weapons component so you could blast your way through a scenario or stealthy way scenario or navigate kind of both uh, hybrid models so it was it was such a a milestone to my mind in in gaming history and um it's you know it's a modern day classic but um we were we funded it and, and published deus ex so what about it's bold uh, being bold in predicting terror attacks and the worldwide pandemic back in 2000 that's the question do you have any stories associated with them if you happen to be affiliated with this title which we now know you are i know it's a lot a lot like the simpsons and many other you know cultures where you're always trying to find um a little bit of a futuristic uh take on things but uh i guess it's a it's a good question from a real fan was i involved is, yeah, uh, I mean, and, and again, and the idea of the bold predictions of, of what the world would look like back then in 2000. Yeah, well, I made a bold prediction in, in the 1981 edition of White Dwarf as the editorial about connected worlds with digital avatars and imagine this world where you could be. I kind of, I wouldn't claim to calling it the metaverse, but I imagine back in, in those days of this connected digital avatars enjoying um, as, as gamers came together in, in digital worlds. So, yeah, I think it's uh, games, games and science fiction books allow us to uh, dream and predict the future, which is good. Definitely. Um, next question. Do you believe that people learn life skills from gaming through gaming? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm a, 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 a big um, advocate for for games based learning and digital creativity. Um, I mean, people don't understand the value of games as a learning medium. If you party prejudice against one or two titles that children shouldn't be playing anyway, and think cognitively what's happening when you're playing a game. Games require you to problem solve. You can't get through a game without solving problems. You learn intuitively. You can fail in a safe environment. You're not punished for making a mistake. The game encourages you to, to try again. And we all learn at different speeds, but in a game, everyone can become a winner. It's not like an exam where on a day you get it right and you're judged as able. If you get it wrong, you're judged as less able. And you have that feel of fear of failure early on in life, which is no motivation for anyone, I would argue. But in the game, it allows everyone to be successful. And games really enable creativity. A child playing Minecraft, digital Lego, building these 3D architectural worlds, sharing them with their friends, can learn by, by applying the heat of a furnace to silica sand, they can create glass. And they can put that glass and put it in their environment. And they won't forget that because that's that's learning by doing, albeit digital learning by doing. They're still doing it themselves. They're not learning it from a broadcast model of a teacher in one ear and out the next ear. It's because it's that applied learning is so important that games are a contextual hub for learning. And games like Ro Roller Coast Tycoon, you're learning about the physics of building rides, the economy of pricing those rides, the staffing levels learn to 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 run those rides effectively a management simulation so there are so many component parts about a cross-curricular uh, multidisciplinary learning that you get through through games i'm a big fan and i think the the world is really just now beginning to understand that learning can be enjoyable <laughs> yeah and you're not just a big fan uh it's true that you have a school that is focused on digital creativity. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, um, it's called the Livingstone Academy Bournemouth. It's on the South Coast here in, in the UK. Um, I, 10 years ago, helped convince the government to put coding on the curriculum. We changed uh, the ICT curriculum to computing. Um, our, we wrote a review called the Next Gen Review. And um, saying that largely that kids were being bored to death with Word, PowerPoints and Excel using other people's software, given no insight how to create their own software and that computer science is an essential discipline. If they want to be kind of authentic citizens of the 21st century world, they need to know how to code or at least know how code works if they don't want to learn to code themselves. So that was our number one recommendation. And somebody, when we actually got it through, said to me, well, you better have a school then to show as a flagship to the world what this is all about and that's like a red rag to the bull to me so i took up that challenge but realized that i was no good at running schools so i teamed up with academies trust who already had 12 schools and the, their their next school was livingstone academy it's been open for two years now and uh it's 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 doing really really well in a very disadvantaged area it's a, it's a state school it's funded by central government it's on a non-discretionary basis it's all to do with proximity to the school whether you want to 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 attend there or not and next year we have another 150 places for year seven and we've had already had some nearly 700 people apply so um wow. so far so good we would want to make this entrepreneurs make them work ready and will ready for this world that's being transformed on a daily basis by technology that's amazing uh, we have another question. As a fiction author, do you have any connections with Terry Pratchett? Well, um, very Mr. loosely. Um, like. I did meet him once before he sadly passed away, but I have worked with Rihanna Pratchett, his 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 daughter. Uh, Rihanna, you may know, has also worked on the, on Tomb Raider narratives and story story telling and she also became we invited her to become a guest author for one of our Fighting Fantasy game books which was Crystal of Storms that came out a couple of years ago. So yeah, she's she's great. And of course, you know, Terry was a absolute legend. Yeah. Are you still writing those interactive books? Yes, I am. It was the 40th anniversary of the Warlock of Firetop, Firetop Mountain last year. And um, so I wrote a new one called Shadow of the Giants and it was published in the UK last year. It's doing pretty well. 
it's already come out in another six or seven languages so it's great to see that interactive books are still relevant today um albeit they don't sell in the numbers that they used to now we've got video games to compete with them but um they still speak to that uh, agency of uh, people wanting to, to determine their own destiny and of course yeah, it's, it's nice to have the, the balance of you know embracing the digital for the experiential learning but making sure that people still know how to pick up a book and, and read a, just a good book uh, i think is an important skill for all of us to maintain over the generations um uh, we actually have questions on where we can get your latest interactive books so uh definitely maybe for folks out of the uk if you have yeah any. well they are available in in, in french and 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 in 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 danish and italian and uh, coming out in germany and they're available in japan um i think they're exported to north america and of course they're available in the uk but of course right. Uh, Amazon. If, if, if anyone's having trouble, of course, there's Amazon and any other um, good book um, platform, distribution platforms that are available digitally. Yeah, it's They are certainly available. And um, yeah, I hope they enjoy Shadow of Giants. And if they want to learn about the origin story of Games Workshop, they might also put in Dicemen into their basket because that's, uh, that's a big, full color, 300 page, glossy uh, coffee table book about the Glorious times when we were living in the van and meeting Gary Gygax and uh, trying to get Games Workshop going. Yeah, definitely. Um, what advice would you give people uh, looking to start a video games company? There's, well, hopefully they will have learned their craft on other people's dime effectively. So if they've had some previous experience uh, working in somebody else's studio and have a kind of a specialist um, superpower, whether it's graphics, games design, technology, monetization, data, whatever it is, they must have some a skill set that speaks to the opportunity because it's a very competitive landscape. But there's always room for new talent. And I'm delighted that in the UK, for example, there are some 2000 studios now a lot of those are micro studios, people doing it in their spare time, bootstrapping their endeavors, but at least they're doing it and they're learning their craft. And hopefully they can go on to do uh, great things and build hit franchises. But when you're starting off, um, I would definitely seek funding to give you the runway and be able to hire the best people and to, to be able to execute in a way that you really want to uh, with a partner who understands the journey you're on, hence whether it's angel investors or at first with, with friends and family or getting a loan, if that's now possible with the banks, just do it. It's better to have, um, you know, 50% of something huge than 100% of something tiny or might never, might never ever grow at all. So that's, really, really important is the funding aspect. Teaming with people to do the jobs you can't do or don't want to do is really important. Um, being able to fail fast and see that failure is just success work in progress. You should not be afraid to fail. Um, you must really enjoy what you do because I think making games is a passion project. People come from outside the industry and say, oh, this looks like a great industry. I'm going to start making games. Unless they've got it and know it and been it and eaten it and drunk it, likely is they're going to fail. So it's being immersed in the opportunity, um, show that passion, have the right skills, tools, funding, and the right people. And you could hopefully, if you have a right idea, have a fair chance of being successful. Amazing. Uh, going on the idea of passion, we have a question here about, do you believe in the indie development sector where one man can develop a game of passion on his own? I absolutely do believe that. I mean, it's been shown many times how, you know, one person companies have, have done amazing things. Um, we all remember Notch Person who created Minecraft. He did that on his own originally. Obviously, he, he built his company and right up to modern times, um, 
yeah human fall flat sold 40 million units developed by one person from oh. from Lithuania whose name I've temporarily forgotten I think it's Tim something or other I can't remember now but of course innovation creativity and uh, new ideas comes from the indie landscape um the the corporate studios make amazing games but usually less innovative than and because they're more risk conscious than all the exciting stuff that's coming out of the indie space but um the most important thing the most exciting thing is that there's room for everybody to be successful one does not displace the other it's the way the way YouTube sits long side Hollywood there's no reason to be competitive there's a there's a the market is big enough now for everyone to be successful whether you're an indie medium-sized company or you know huge 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 studio so 100 200 people plus amazing um final question and ask respectively will you ever retire uh in a, in a word no you know i've been making games for or being in the games for some 47 years um yeah work and play is the same for me it's been a passion project for me from being a games player to having this incredible time and career in an industry that i love and the people in it they're usually for most parts humble collaborative not ego driven like a lot of entertainment industries are so it's a, a great space um there's always new ideas i'm always excited about the next opportunity whether it's technology whether it's gameplay whether it's platform whether it's new ways of of connecting with other people it's an amazing industry and i include ball games and video games in in that in that sentence uh, there's, there's, what, what there's about escape get, rooms <laughs> i i never get out of it I'm oh still, yeah <laughs> you're still in your escape room it's one it's for me it's the best industry in the world and um what, what else am i going to do <laughs>